YouTube. My name is Elizabeth and I read bouquets and books. And this is the O tag. It is part of the alphabetical series created by Jim at Jim's Books Reading and Stuff. So far in that series, I've done tags for letters B, C, D, E, and F. At first I thought I would go on to G, but today I saw the O tag and in there there's a prompt that is just for me. Um, I don't know if it's just for me, but it really is perfect for me because I have good answers for that one. As opposed to many of the other prompts for which I, my only answer will be no. So this could also be the no tag in many ways. You will see. <laughs> so O is for one, two, four. The address in Beloved. Is there an address in your reading that stands out? So what I did, I just closed my eyes and the first address that popped up in my mind was 75 Vaugirard Street. Okay, I'm counting to three to let you guess. One, two, three. It's the address of Aramis in The Three Musketeers. It is of no importance whatsoever to the plot. In fact, it's completely nonsensical because at the time The Three Musketeers are set, uh, the, the story is set, it's set in the 1600s, there were no numbers on the houses. That's a 19th century invention. So 75 de Vaugirard did not exist in 1600 something, so there's no way that Aramis could have lived there. And anyway, Aramis did not exist, so there's no way he could have lived anywhere. But the number sticks in my memory for I don't know which reason. I remember that name, and the worst is that Aramis is not even my favorite of the Musketeers. I'm pretty sure that the address of the other three Musketeers is named too, well, three including D'Artagnan and Aramis and Porthos, but I don't remember the, the, the address where they live. I remember Athos lives on Rue du Ferron. I remember that. But the rest I don't remember. So 75 Rue de Vaugirard, but there's really no good literary reason for that. It's just my memory that decides that this address is important. Oh, it's for Once Upon a Time. What is your favorite fairy tale? Um, I don't understand this enthusiasm for fairy tales. Um, I, I had, uh, I read them as a child. No, my father read them to me when I was a child. But beyond that, uh, as an adult, I cannot say that any fairy tale is near to my heart. Um, I like the Disney version of Beauty and the Beast. Um, so that's a movie, that's a, a cartoon movie. Um, but um, nothing else beyond that. So I cannot really say that I have a favorite fairy tale. Oh, is for the Observer's books. Do you have any? No, <laughs> I don't even know what they are. It's the first time I hear about them, so. I don't have any. O is for Olga Tokarczuk and Oran Pamuk. Have you read either of these Nobel Prize winning authors? No. <laughs> Though Pamuk is on my TBR, I do want to read him. However, Tokarczuk, for some reason, doesn't, doesn't really attract me. I don't know why. I probably will read something at some point in my life, but uh, not in the near future. O is for Old Curiosity Shop. What is your least favorite Dickens novel? I've read just two so far. I've read David Copperfield and A Christmas Carol. Uh, out of the two, I cannot say that one is my least favorite. Uh, I can say the one that I'm least tempted to read is Oliver Twist. Um, it seems to be a story about battered children and cruel people, and I don't feel like reading that. So I probably will not read Oliver Twist in quite a while. However, I do want to read Bleak House, but that wouldn't be the worst of Dickens, so... Anyway, <laughs> next prompt. Next prompt uh, O is for Oxford. What was the last book you read set at a prestigious prestigious university? Um, I had to think about it for this one. I went through my uh, notebook and uh, looked and I found a book of nonfiction because I don't remember any novels set at a university. But last year I read this nonfiction. It's called Grasp the Science Transforming How We Learn by Sanjay Sarma and Luke Yokinto. So that's the cover. And it's a science book about how we learn. And uh, I don't know if you can see the small print there. It says that Sarma is head of open learning at MIT. So a good chunk of the book is based on a particular class that is taught at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. It's a class where the students have to build a robot. So it's a practical learning class and the students have they have access to a lot of material, they have access to a lot of resources, 
and it's um, as the author says, it's one of the best learning environments is that particular class. But unfortunately, it's very expensive. So it's unlikely that this type of learning could be used in any sort of class at every level. Um, but anyway, it is mainly set, well, not mainly, but partly set at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Next prompt. Oh, it's for Ovid. Have you read Ovid's Metamorphose? No, <laughs> I have not. Oh, it's for original. Have you created any original tags? No, I've thought of many. In fact, I wrote down the questions for quite a few, but I never had the guts to film them and post them. I think I will at some point, but so far I haven't done any. So, extra additional or alternative prompts. Yes, I need those. O is for opening lines. Do you have any favorite opening lines? Well, I'm a fan of Jane Austen, so of course I have to quote the first line of Pride and Prejudice. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. A lot of the book is right in that first sentence. It's brilliant. But I want to say a few words about what was once upon a time voted the worst opening line in history, and that is, it was a dark and stormy night. I don't remember who the author was, but the story goes that Schultz got this famous Snoopy opening line, it was a dark and stormy night, from the winner of that particular contest, or I don't know, perhaps it was just a, a newspaper writer who decided that... Uh, once upon a, that uh, that particular opening line was god awful but the reason i want to talk about it is that almost that almost exact opening line is in the three musketeers in chapter 20 no not 25 65 at chapter 65 the trial the opening line is it was a stormy and dark night and to me, it's a great opening line. I think it sets up the mood. Uh, that particular chapter of The Three Musketeers is great. I love it. It is terrifying. It is scary. It, it could be the, it, in itself, it could almost be a horror book. So I think It Was a Dark and Stormy Night does not deserve the bad reputation that it has. I think it does set the tone. Now, of course, it's a bit cliche to set a horror story or whichever story in a dark and stormy night. But dark and stormy nights happen, so I think they're allowed to be in books. So I, I want to give a shout to It Was a Dark and Stormy Night. It's not as bad as people say. <laughs> o is for offensive. Oh no, I skipped one. O is for Obama. Have you read Becoming or A Promised Land? No. <laughs> o is for offensive. Does profanity bother you? No, no, no. Does profanity bother you when you read it? Sometimes, and the reason it bothers me, it's not because of the profanity, it's because to be, it's lazy writing, particularly in romance books. Um, I've tried a few ones, uh, well, I've tried, for a long time, I did not read romance. I read romance as a teenager, and then I did not pick up a single romance book until last year. Uh, I think the pandemic was going to my head, and I went to the library and picked up a few romance books. Uh, a few romance books, uh, mainly after having seen so many videos by Sarah at Bookish Knitter. And one of the books that I picked up was a Regency novel set, uh, well, set during Regency, but written on it, it, during our time. So it's a modern Regency novel. And within the first two or three pages, there were four swear words. And to me, that was just lazy writing. It was just a way to say that, look, this is a modern book. Um, my character has grit, but yeah, it, it, I didn't like it. So I just shut the book and brought it back to the library. I just didn't like it. Uh, it was that bad. It bothered me that much. It was lazy writing. So it's not the profanity that bothers me. It's the fact that profanity is used in a lazy way. And I think it applies not only to romance book. I think it has become an easy way for writers to show that their characters have personality. The swear word is not a personality, so meh. Um, o is for Oprah. Have you read or started a book because of a celebrity endorsement? No. <laughs> In fact, I I'm going to go further and say that if a book is endorsed by Oprah or Reese Witherspoon or 
well, mainly these two, I will tend to stay away because I sort of kind of feel like these books are, it sounds awful, but are full of feelings. Um, to, to me, I don't know, they, they signify a type of book that I will probably not like. Uh, some sort of uh, either a family tragedy or, no, it's triumph through adversity. I think that's the thing we see most in Oprah's books and in Reese Witherspoon books, triumph through adversity and I don't really care for that. Not that I don't care for triumph in adversity, but I don't necessarily want it in a novel. It's the sort of thing I would like to see more in a memoir or perhaps more in other types of nonfiction. Uh, well, if it's well done, I don't mind a novel. Maybe I have prejudices. Maybe I'm prejudiced against celebrity book clubs. Anyway, the answer is no. O is for Oregon, Ohio and Oklahoma. Have you... How did I pronounce Oregon? 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 Oregano? Anyway, Northwestern United States, Ohio and Oklahoma. Have you read any books set in any of these states? Probably, but I cannot think of any. Um, as I looked on my shelves, I did not see any, so I'm going to answer no. <laughs> um, oh, it's for Ontario. Have you read a book set in this province? Yes! And that's the prompt to why I decided to do this tag. I have a whole bunch. Now, I read a lot of books set in Ontario and I chose only books that are specifically set in Ontario, uh, meaning not just a general idea of Ontario. For example, um, uh, Jalna by Maisel Laroche. We know it's set in Ontario, but it's not necessarily a specific place in Ontario. So first example, The Whirlpool by Jane Urquhart. This is set in Niagara Falls. It is set at the end of the 19th century. It is sort of a gothic novel in the sense that it's kind of dark and gloomy. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, there's, a, it's about an undertaker's widow. So that, that's why I mean, uh, that's what I mean by dark and gloomy. Um, but it's not a horror book. It's just a uh, it's just a bit dark. So it's end of 19th century in Niagara Falls. This is The Blue Castle by Lucy Maud Montgomery. That is the author of Anne of Green Gables. This book is a bit of an exception in her work in the sense that the hero is not a child. Uh, it's a woman who is 28 years old at the opening of the book. And uh, it is set not in Prince Edward Island, but in Ontario, more precisely in the Muskoka region. And uh, for those of you who don't know, the Muskoka region is to Toronto what the Hamptons are to New York. Uh, however, it is not set in a, in a house of rich people, uh, quite the opposite. So our heroine uh, Valency is uh, 28 years old and quite poor, living with her mother, uh, who is extremely strict and she's very sad. It's her birthday and she's quite depressed, but it ends well. Another book. Oh, that one is a French-Canadian book. Uh, the English title is And the Birds Rained Down. It is set in Northern Ontario. Now, uh, what is Northern Ontario? If you look at the map of Ontario, it's like um, not quite a, a rectangle. It's more of, it's a rectangle, but the one side is a bit of a triangle. And there's sort of a a bit of land that is between the Great Lakes. Now that teeny tiny bit of land is Southern Ontario and that is where the overwhelming mass majority of people live in Ontario, including me. Uh, I'm in Ottawa so that would be a bit at the top of that bit of land, but it is Southern Ontario. Northern Ontario is the massive expand of land that covers between the eastern border of Quebec all the way to Manitoba and it's covered in forests. Lake and forests everywhere, it is massive. Now, in this book, we are set in the 1990s. The main character is a woman, a photographer, and her project is to take pictures of survivors of the Great Fires of the 1920s. In the 1920s, in Northern Ontario, there were great fires that killed hundreds of people. There were forest fires and they just burned everything uh, on their path. And uh, so we have flashbacks of the 1920s and, um, and the, the, the present, which is the 1990s. Uh, that book was translated in many, many languages. Uh, it, it's the sort of book that is closely tied to where it's set. So it gives a really good feel of Northern Ontario. 
Uh, a non-fiction also set in Northern Ontario. This is Seven Fallen Feathers by Tanya Talaga. Uh, it's, it's a sad story. Um, as I said, Northern Ontario is huge, uh, but sparsely populated. And most, well, I don't know if it's most, but a lot of the population is native. They live in reserves very far from urban centers. And those reserves are quite small. They don't have uh, secondary school. They don't have high schools. So it means that the children, uh, the teenagers, have to go to Thunder Bay to go to high school. Uh, well, not all of Northern Ontario goes to, to Thunder Bay, but some of them go to Thunder Bay. And uh, recently, uh, in recent years, quite a number of these Indigenous students were found dead uh, in Thunder Bay. And the police did not really investigate. They judged that it was either suicide or accident and no proper investigation was done. So this is a book about this lack of investigation, about uh, the sy systemic racism in Thunder Bay and probably elsewhere in Canada, but uh, this one focuses on Thunder Bay. Um, very sobering read. Okay, um, let's move on. I have others, but they will be for another prompt. Oh, it's for Orwell. What have you read by George Orwell? No, <laughs> I've never read George Orwell. However, he's on my TBR. I don't know if you can see it. I'll stretch. This is 1984, so that's my TBR there. So I will read it quite soon. The reason is that I want to read a nonfiction book about 1984. Uh, the nonfiction book is called Orwell in Cuba. It is written by a French-Canadian journalist, Frédéric Lavoie, and it is about the publication of 1984 in Cuba. Uh, recently, the authorities authorized the publication of that very pernicious novel. So, um, yeah, I want to read the nonfiction, but first I think I have to read 1984. So it's on my soon to be read list. And finally, O is for own. Feel free to add your own prompts. I will. So we said earlier that O is for Ontario. O is also for Ottawa. Ottawa, Ontario, where I live. And I do have books that are set in Ottawa. One that I finished yesterday, two days ago, this one, A Secret Between Us, like this. A Secret Between Us by Daniel Poliquin. Uh, I don't know if you can see, uh, the picture on the top is a picture, is a drawing, a painting of uh, World War I. It is a bit about World War I. Our main character, the narrator, is from Ottawa. And no, he's not from Ottawa at all. He's from the province of Quebec. He's from somewhere between Montreal and Quebec City. Um, he, he's from a village that's not named, but uh, he goes to school in, in the Trois-Rivières. So that's halfway between Montreal and Quebec on the north side of the St. Lawrence River. Um, and somehow he ends up being a journalist in Ottawa. And after that, he goes to the war. And after the war, he comes back to Ottawa. And um, it's not a tragedy. It's... It's a comedy because uh, there are really funny moments in there, but at the same time, it's tragic. So uh, I have the word in French. I would say uh, it's um, rire grinçant. You sort of uh, yellow laughing. It, it, could that be rire jaune? Um, it's funny without being funny. It's like the, the tragedy of it. Um, there's a character in there that I just adore. Um, her name is Concorde, and her life is a tragedy, except that she doesn't know it. And she's, in fact, comedic relief in this book. She is funny, but her life is a tragedy, but she's funny. So it's the sort of book that is half funny, half tragedy, and all mixed into one. And at first I wasn't quite sure, but I read the last 100, 150 pages just in one go. Uh, I, and I had a smile on my face. I just loved, 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 loved that book. So it's a secret between us. And uh, another one that I have is The Best Laid Plan. Uh, that one became a TV series by uh, the CBC. And there's also a sequel to that, or maybe even two sequels. Uh, it is set in Ottawa and even more precisely in the world of Parliament. Uh, our narrator, the main character, Daniel, works as a speechwriter for the Prime Minister. However, he suddenly, quite suddenly, decides to quit 
because he realizes that uh, that's not what he wants to do with his life. And I'm going to read you. Oh, I should say this is a funny novel. It's uh, humor. Uh, it won the Stephen Leacock Award, which is for a humorous writing in Canada. So, um, as I said, our main character is... Uh, writing speeches for the Prime Minister, and he works in the building of Parliament in Ottawa. And uh, the reason he decides to put an end to his career is that uh, he discovers a little something. Uh, his girlfriend is also working for someone in Parliament, so she's on Parliament Hill. And uh, one night, while our narrator is walking in Centre Block, so that's the main block with uh, the main building with this tower at the top, he sees the following. He says, I'll recount the story, but out of respect, I'll take care to honor the strictures of parliamentary language. Rachel, my Rachel, was on her knees in front of the opposition house leader. Let's just say she was rather enthusiastically lobbying his caucus. Stunned and devastated, I turned away to get a better view in the lee of a well-endowed rubber plant. Rachel jumped into her advance work with both hands before moving to what seemed to be his favorite part of the proceedings, oral questions. Eventually, he pulled her up off the floor and onto the desk, where he begged leave to introduce his private member's bill. Clearly, there was unanimous consent as the cut and thrust of the debate started immediately, well, mostly thrust. By the look on her face, second reading was proceeding satisfactorily with just a few indecipherable heckles thrown in for good measure. The house leader occasionally shouted, hear, hear, and slapped her back bench in support. At one point, she amended her position on his bill, and the debate continued. <laughs> so that gives you an idea of the tone of this book. Uh, a lot of puns, uh, a lot of really awkward situations, and it's quite funny. So another book set in Ottawa. Um, other prompts with O. O is for orchestra. I'm a sucker for any book about orchestras. As you can probably see there, this is these are books about music. My favorite book on orchestra is one in French, so I wonder, is there something similar in English? This is Au Cœur de l'Orchestre, so it could be translated as At the Heart of the Orchestra. And this is a book about how orchestra works. Um, it starts by the history of the orchestra, because it's quite a recent invention, if we consider that for a long time music was done by only a few a few people at a time, so uh, 100 people orchestras are quite recent in history. And it tells how musicians are paid, because they don't really work 9 to 5, so how are they paid, uh, how do you get in an orchestra, and then within the orchestra he goes section by section and explains uh, what is the role of each instrument and what are the pieces that are that, that put these instruments in at the, the fourth at the at the forefront that's the word that I'm looking for and uh, the third section is about the conductors what is the role of the conductors so that was a fascinating book about orchestras and one that I'm reading right now is the maestro myth uh, great conductors in pursuit of power by Norman Lebrecht uh, I don't know how to pronounce his name uh, he is the infamous editor of slipped disc which is some sort of blog where you have all the gossip about classical music um, so I, I'm, I'm two pages in, I think, so I don't have a lot uh, read so far, but it sounds like a kind of a gossipy book, so I think that's going to be fun. And last prompt that I invent for me is O is for odd. What is the oddest book that I own? Um, I don't know if it's the book itself that is odd, but it's the fact that I own it, and that would be Cantor's Magic Shop, the 1951 catalog. Yes, I have a catalog dating from the 1950s. And in that you can buy, what is it? The Devil Glass, a simple and clean cut effect, free from rings, tapes, ribbons, etc. And when we say it is empty, we mean actually empty of all liquid. You pick up this large eight ounce clear glass tumbler, show it around, and in full view, it visibly fills itself with any liquid desired. You drink it or pour it out and the glass visibly refills itself again and again. So they, it's all, um, whoops, oh, and that's if I want to order. Um, 
the, the reason why I own this, I don't know anybody who does magic. So it, the way I got this book is that I got it from my parents' place. Uh, once upon a time, a few years ago, uh, I asked if I could take a bookcase with me in Ottawa because my mother was thinking of downsizing. So she was very happy to get rid of a whole bunch of stuff, including the bookcase. So I brought the bookcase with me and then she said, oh, by the way, if you want any books in there, just grab them because I'm going to get rid of them. And in that, I found three books about magic, two catalogs and one how-to book. And I won. And first, they're in English. So that means my mother can't read that. So it was my father's. And I cannot see my father doing magic, tri ma magic tricks. It just doesn't fit. It, it makes no sense. So I asked him, how come you have these books? Were you once interested in magic? And of course he said no, because he never was. The reason he has that is that uh, once upon a time in the 1950s, one of his friends needed money and he asked, can I borrow some money? I'll give you my stuff and uh, I'll come back to get it and I'll pay you back. So my father lend, lended him, I don't know if it was $20 or $50, something like that. And uh, my father got uh, the possessions of that friend and at the time the possessions were um, I think a turning table a turn table uh, to, to, to play records so a record player and three books of magic so two catalogs and one how-to book uh, he got rid of the record player eventually but he kept the books so if that friend ever comes back and wants to pay back the 20 or 50 dollars we can give him back Three things. I still have the books. So that is it for the O tag. Uh, if you feel like doing it, please do it. Consider yourself tag. And uh, thank you very much, Jim, for doing this tag. I thought it was a lot of fun. Thank you, everyone, for watching. I will see you in the next video. À la prochaine!